learn from two professional real estate agents about their perspectives of the market. I am Jessica Preventure, the broker owner here of Pro Homes Group with Leia Realty Partners out of Bow, New Hampshire. And I'm here with my fabulous co-host and agent partner, Keith Valancourt. Hi everyone. Let's dive right in. So we are gonna start with this bombshell. Big news. I don't, I mean, it's been a bombshell since it came up in the first place. This class action lawsuit in Illinois. Illinois? Illinois. 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 Um, well, a federal judge just granted a class action suit. Uh, so what's interesting about this, if you're not aware about this before, uh, if you haven't been aware about this, you should be. Whether you're a buyer, a seller, an agent, everybody, a, everybody this, yeah. it is has the potential to really ch change the landscape of the real estate industry for Everyone. Everybody. Everybody involved. Absolutely. Back in uh, 2019, this got put out, I believe. Yeah, there were two actually that came out. The first That's one's right. called Merrill, and the, the little smaller one is Sitzer Burnett. But basically, these sellers brought an antitrust suit against the National Association of Realtors. So, in many cases, you need to be a member of the National Association of Realtors to access your local MLS. Here in New Hampshire, that is the case. In order to have access to Prime MLS, which is the primary um, multiple listing service for New Hampshire and Vermont, you have to be part of the National Association of Realtors. Now, the National Association of Realtors says that you have to put in the MLS compensation for the buyers and the buyer's agent, excuse me. And typically that has been covered from the seller. So sellers are basically saying that's BS, that we as the seller should not be paying for representation of the buyers. That's right, that's right. The buyer's agent or buyer's representation be, be, should be paying that compensation. Right, and that's where for me, the first like, is this really you know yeah. accurate? I mean, don't get me wrong. I have no problem with buyers paying for their own agent, but it's kind of like the way it rolled out. Sure, of course. Of course, buyers didn't have agents a long time ago. Exactly right. It used to be that only um, sellers had agents and whatever, whoever, whatever agent brought the buyer still legally had that fiduciary relationship with the seller. So that's why the sellers paid them both. But then buyers were like, that doesn't seem right. We should have representation. And that went through in New Hampshire. But uh, sellers continue to just pay the fee as it, as it would and compensate for those. But now it's being brought up that buyers should be paying for those compensations instead of having the sellers kind of added into their costs. Right. And that's where I have a, a little problem with in some ways, because essentially that cost is inflating the overall sale price. So when it comes down to it, the buyers are picking up that cost through a higher sale price and therefore they're really mortgaging the, that cost. So it's very, very complicated. Sure, it is very complicated. The other piece though, what do you think in terms of asking your buyers to pay you? Well, I think that there's a way that you can, you approach it where, um, you know, you're providing goods, you're providing services, you're, you're doing something to earn that. Um, I think it is a great discussion and I see, you know, both sides of it. Uh, but I think the buyers probably should be, you know, compensating their own agents and um, that way the sellers have a little less control over the whole mm -hmm. situation in general. They're um, they're not dictating how much the buyer agent is actually getting and you can almost negotiate that directly with the buyer and not have to worry about um, the seller and the seller may be uh, picking a certain agent because they know they, they are less or whatever the case may be. I totally agree. And I think too, um, while you were talking, of course, you know, the thoughts go right out of my mind, but I think that there are ways for buyers to pick up that cost. Right, I think there's a lot of agents out there that the idea of this makes them panic. Well, that's because they've been marketing themselves as my services are free. Well, my services aren't free. <laughs> and Mine aren't free either. You should be able to articulate to the consumer why you are worth 
what you are worth sure. and how to be compensated. And I think that there will be more and more ways that will come out in terms of, for example, and I'm going off on a rant here, Sometimes it takes six months, a year, 18 months to buy with a buyer and we don't get compensated until we close. Maybe there's a way to change that compensation model so that we have a smaller monthly retainer. Hey, if I show you a property this month, there's this retainer fee and then we take okay. a smaller commission when the deal actually closes. You know, I think there's gonna be a lot of creativity in terms of how to make this accessible, but I don't think the role of a buyer agent goes away at all. Sure, of course. I think there's still money to be made there and work to be done. Um, so that's that's what's happening. Uh, I know we, we've been talking about the agents, but this is super important for the seller and, and the buyer as well, for the seller to control their costs, as Keith mentioned, for the buyer to pay, you know, there'll be a lot more agents doing more work if their buyer can just say no, if they're not sending them properties or being on top or, you know, that kind of stuff. So what does this do for the, uh, what does this do for the, uh, the potential I saw, I was noticing here? It could, it could date back to 2015 as far oh, yeah. as the potential, uh, money going out for, for these lawsuits, if they go through, um, upwards of looks like 13.7 billion um, is a low end and if they reward something called treble damages, which I assume are trickle down damages, could go up to 41.1 billion that they have to pay back to all sellers from 2015 to 2020. So, you know, not a small thing. No, but and then that's a, that's a whole nother can of worms. Like what does that do to NARA as an organization? Sure. What does that do to these very large brokerages that were named, for example, um, anywhere, which was formerly Real Realology, Home Services of America, Remox, and Keller Williams. These are like the big guns in the industry. And if they have to be paying back their commissions <laughs> on the sales side, um, yeah, I mean, how will they survive? And then what does that look like for smaller boutique brokerages or mid-sized brokerages like ours? Yeah. Speaking of which, our brokerage, Leo Realty, made the top 500, right. um, which is pretty exciting. But anyway, that's a whole nother story. Yes. <laughs> which we'll talk about yes. another time. Yes, another time. Um, all right, you wanna go into what's going on in legislation in yeah. real estate in New Absolutely. Hampshire, specifically, Absolutely. since Absolutely. that's where we are? That's some good news. Yeah, there was some good news in yeah. here, for sure. Good news, let's like uh, House Bill 507 did not go through. Looks like uh, over 1900 New Hampshire realtors all put in their vote to uh, to table that discussion for now. It looks like that's gonna happen, so that's fantastic. So at least buying us a little bit of time here. Yeah, um, and so, so just to be to clarify, that bill would have eliminated the requirement for over 40 professions to hold licensure. So yes, Real estate agents are a big part of that because we are required to have a license, but it also would have removed the need for a license for dental hygienists, for hairdressers, for massage therapists, pretty much every 40 professions, which to me, like who even came up with this? I, <laughs> like, I, I don't want anyone cleaning my Going teeth. backwards. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I call, mean, call my cousin to, to do my teeth, right? <laughs> Um, well, which cousin? <laughs> yeah, that's true. But I do think, um, I mean, I don't know how you feel, Keith, but I personally think real estate agents should, they should require more education and licensure. What do you think? I think that there's, there's endless amount of education out there and there's endless amounts of knowledge and experience and to not have to be certified to, to deal with people's biggest expenses or, or their life savings or their dream homes or something that they've saved up their whole lives for to just be able to willy nilly kind mm -hmm. of wheel and deal and not have licenses to do those type of things. I mean, that's just real estate, let alone the other 39, mm -hmm. you know, professions that uh, probably all feel the same exact way. I just think you got to have some sort of checks and balances to, you know, goods and services, money being exchanged anytime. Well, I think that's the hard thing, right? Because we talk about red tape to a certain extent, but also, you know, and there are industries where there's so much 
regulation, it makes it hard to move forward. But it, at least in real estate, when you're talking about a 40 hour course and one exam, I mean, that's, that's the minimum standard for anything I think that would require a license. Um, certainly, I hope that LNAs and dentists and hairdressers that are working with chemicals on your head, like have a little bit more education than sure. that. And the idea that we would just kind of say, you can do it on your own is a little, it's uh, un, you know, unsettling. I yes. Think. So the fact that now we, I think, where do we have a year? I think it's going to go back on yeah. the table and they'll, they'll talk about it. And, um, you know, during while I was reading about that good news, um, you know, okay. there were there were a couple other bills here that I noticed that um, were on the table and uh, looks like some some groundwater contaminant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know this isn't really real estate, but it, it caught my attention with the PFAs and House Bill 398 and House Bill 205. And they're basically they're still including uh, radon, arsenic, lead as far as things that you have to test for when you're buying and selling. Well, there are things you have to disclose. There are things you have to disclose, right? Yeah, so um, all three of those things, radon, lead paint, and arsenic in the water are obviously unhealthy contaminants. contaminants. Yeah. And so what we our current system says, and it's in the purchase and sales, in the disclosures, is if a seller is aware that they have some of these things, they mm -hmm. must disclose it. So what these two bills are talking about is polyfluorinated alkyl substances, which if you know anything about what happened with the St. Gobain issue in Merrimack, that that's what was leaching into the water, and they can, I'm uh, sorry, into the, like the groundwater, they also are contaminants. So now what they're saying is, if you as the seller are aware that you have PFAs, 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 yeah, I said it right. <laughs> then you would be required to disclose that again. Which oh, I mean, yeah. I personally say yes. Why would of course, you know? Why would course. you not? Of course, if you're unaware, if you don't know, then you don't have to disclose it, and the buyer can put that into inspections. But um, you know, I, I I'm a big fan of disclose, disclose, disclose. The more you can disclose, at least you're putting it out there. It's for people to see, for people to know, and then you can kind of make the adjustments or, you know, um, adjust accordingly as you need to. A hundred percent. Cause like radon in New Hampshire, we know it's everywhere. Yep. And you just kind of prep your clients. Like these are the contacts. If you have to do abatement, it, it happens, it's normal. And then the buyer themselves makes the decision. And sometimes you have buyers that say, I'm not going to buy a house that has excess radon. And then fine. You're looking at the right thing. It's the same thing with lead paint. You know, if I have clients that are like, I absolutely do not want lead paint, then I say then we're not going to look at any homes that were built prior to 1978 because right. the chances of them having it very good. are very high. So let's just look at newer build homes and you adjust, adjust your thing. But it's certainly helpful to have that information provided if the seller indeed knows it. And with water treatment, the way that they build nowadays, the more prep that they do underneath the ground, water treatment is more important than ever because there's more and more contaminants that are filtering into more and more wells. The more wells they drill, the more foundations they put in, the more blasting they do. Um, it's just, uh, the water's not getting better as we right. go. There, there isn't a way to, you know, make it better as you prep to build a house. You bring it in and it's, you get what you get. Your, your well is a collection of streams. And those streams are gonna, you're gonna add streams, detract uh, streams, whether it's good water, bad water. Um, so these are very important things when you're, when you're buying a building for sure. So when you, when you talk to clients, do you typically prefer, or do you think it's safer to be on public water? So that's most public water will be treated. Um, so, but what we now see on the rise is more and more chlorine that people are seeing in the water from oh. town water and treated water. So, you know, I don't know if it's a rise in the amount of chlorine that, that the towns are using, but we certainly see more and more people sensitive to the chlorine in the water. So we have been actually treating a lot of town water more recently. So it's a little bit of a 
uh, good and bad. There's good benefits to well water where you know you don't have the, the the bill, the monthly bill. If you have nice clean water, that's great. But you can have some wells that have some really bad water, and you're spending a lot of money on water treatment. treatment yeah. And a lot of these houses, when you build them, you don't you don't know until right. the house is built. They're drilling the well. You're bringing your water in, and you see what you got. And yeah. even then, it's usually not till like three or four months till you're in the house mm -hmm. using, using the it water, turning yeah. it over, and then you take a sample. Then you get that what the actual level is, and by then the builder has already said, "Yeah, I'm not fixing it." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've tested, which is I think one of the bills in here on why they couldn't come to an agreement with was on testing new construction, right? Oh, away. and that's what I was going to ask you. So, do you typically recommend to your clients that they test? their water for potable or more um, if it's private and if it's public? Typically, you can ask if it's public, you should be able to ask your town for the latest water report. Oh, I love it. Okay. You know, they're not going to go giving it out to you. But if you if you just call and ask them for it, they should be able to give you it. Or you can take a sample and bring it down to your to your local. Yeah, lab. like Nelson's um, yeah. But yeah, absolutely. But the main thing is the new construction because what you have originally isn't necessarily what's going to be there in two to three months. Sure. And with the new construction, usually comes more things in your water. If it's an established neighborhood where there's, you know, house here, house there, you know, it's an older neighborhood, your water probably is what it is. Mm, Nowadays, the more of these, the more they cram these houses in these smaller neighborhoods, all these and wells are closer together. they're pushing everything up and they're exactly. relocating stuff. Exactly, so water's not getting cleaner as we get new construction. And that's an important note, to, note about new construction, period, yep, is absolutely. people think, oh, new construction, nothing is gonna be wrong. That's not true. Um, because some of the issues that come up with a home don't come up till you've been there. For example, nice. even the radon, a lot of people won't test their radon as soon as the house is built because it's basically been open to sure. the elements and it hasn't had an opportunity to kind of accumulate there. Um, so you might test it when you first move in and there's no problem and a year later now there's a problem well radon's a radon's a funky thing you know it's a little bit higher in the winter time as opposed to the summertime you, you know but every house is its own entity and it's all based on that permeability typically the more permeable you are under the slab the higher the radon's going to be because you're 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 your house is going to act more like a vacuum and kind of mm. pull in those radon gases naturally um so typically the newer the construction, the higher the radon, but usually the higher the radon, the easier it is to get out because it's coming into your home very easily, which means I can take it out of your home very easily. So um, it's a kind of a catch 22. You need the drainage and for, for um, you need the, the crushed stone and the prep for the drainage and that sort of thing. But unfortunately it's gonna give you maybe possibly bad water, possibly radon, mm -hmm. and now soil gases and anything can kind of leach into your home um, including with the, you know, the tighter we make these houses, that all kind of increases it in more. Exactly. Fascinating. So it's very, the point is it's hard to stay healthy <laughs> and just environmentally. Yep. What do you think about the whole ability to terminate leases if you have a, a court order or validation of some sort of abuse? I think that that's perfectly, I think that's perfectly fine. I to tell you the truth, until I read this, I didn't know that that wasn't a thing that you right. could do. You know, I didn't know that you, that was a thing. Uh, but it seems to make sense. I'm all about things that are logical in that. 100%. That make sense. And all about keeping people safe. Oh, of course. Right? So we are ta we talked about environmental, but if you're not safe in your home, you shouldn't be afraid that you can't afford to break a lease in order to stay safe. So that's interesting. This is another one that, well, this one narrowly passed, which is good. It's House Bill 261. Um, just to go back, the PFAs um, were both retained and then tabled. And I thought the expansion of accessory dwell it, dwelling units was pretty interesting too. You've always been able to do one and now they are, they're kind of trying to say, can we do two? Do you have a right to add up to two? Even with one being detached from the primary residence, mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting. So again, it didn't get outright killed. It's up for review, uh, not something that passed, but certainly something to be looking at here in New Hampshire. I know we, we, we talk about New Hampshire because that's where we are and you know you're our clients and our our agent friends and and we want you to be aware of what's going on and if, if you haven't heard the market here is it's not like the west coast 
of, of the United States. We are still very, very hot. We haven't seen a price deterioration. We're still seeing multiple offers, etc. So when we're talking about accessory units, about families, multi-generational homes, you know, um, that stuff's important. And that's, that's stuff to keep our eye on in terms of, of the changing market. Absolutely. What do we have to say to agents in general? What are our tips for agents this, this episode? Oh, we got, um, <clears throat> we have an article here that is, well, it's not really an article, just kind of the seven biggest, this is about, has to do with your real estate agents um, and the taxes that you have to do. Um, mm -hmm. And it's the seven biggest mis uh, tax mistakes that real, ag real estate agents make. Um, so I thought that I wanted to What did to you think the and... biggest one was? What, what, what were you like, <laughs> ooh, shoot, I might do that. <laughs> well, I, more than one, first of all, but you know, the failing to track my, my income and expenses, like I can't tell you how many times I'm like, oh, I'll just put on this credit card or I'll pay cash for it or I'll use a debit card or I didn't get a receipt or they, there's no receipt paper in the machine. Yes, you know, it yes, just doesn't yes. I'm like, I'm not going in to get a receipt. Um, so that was, that was one that right away I was like, Ooh, yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a victim of that one for sure. For sure. And there's a bunch of apps that you can use mm -hmm. to, to track that stuff. So I'm a big fan of, you need a budget, um, but you can also use, um, Quicken will do that for you. And there's a couple others that I'll link below that I'm the spacing on the name right now that I've tried that will not only track, um, your expenses. It'll just pull in from your account, sure. but also your mileage. Your car is a huge deduction that I don't see people taking. I mean, that's wear and tear. Wear, I don't know. I do 30,000 miles a year at yeah. least, you know? Um, so you want to make sure you're doing that. Uh, I totally, I mean, if you don't know what you're spending on your business, because remember it all reduces your taxable income. So for someone that's an employee, you get a W-2, all your taxes are taken out, your Medicare, your da 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 and you don't really have business deductions, right? Sure. You have your, maybe your child tax credit, or maybe if you own a home, you have the taxes on that, but that's really it. Well, when you're a real estate agent or broker, you're an entrepreneur. So we're paid as contractors, 1099. There's nothing taken out. We're, we've, we're given just like a flat check. So if you're not paying your quarterlies, <laughs> or putting money aside, you're in trouble. You'll be paying. <laughs> You'll be paying. If you're not putting away for your own retirement, then you're going to be working forever. Thankfully, we can in our job. <laughs> um, but also all those expenses. Um, and they, they listed, you know, all of your marketing is deductible. Oh, yeah. Um, I found out some, read through this, I found out some things. I said, oh, perfect. So yeah. I'll add that on to <laughs> Yeah. And then as you deduct those expenses, then your tax on your income, the profit after all of those deductions. If you're not tracking it from the beginning of the year, you're leaving money on the table, essentially, is how I feel. I agree, I agree. Um, I know. Well, one of them that came up for me is ignoring the home office. So <laughs> in the past, a lot of agents wouldn't claim their home office because it was kind of like a red flag to the IRS, like they're going to come audit you. But now after COVID, everybody's freaking working from home. <laughs> so definitely, definitely, definitely make sure if you are working from home, if you have designated space in your home that is devoted to your work as a real estate agent, an office, even if it's a couple square well, more than a couple, but you know, a hundred yeah. square feet in your dining room or something where you have a computer and a, make sure you're deducting that Absolutely. because Take that's advantage of all the deductions. You 100%. Can. And this is one I think that lots of agents do. And you kind of alluded to it a little bit is mixing personal and professional mm -hmm. finances. Like I'll use this card. Oh, I'll use this, whatever. And it kind of it's like you're like Whoops. make sure you have a good tax guy that can go through all that well you nailed it you <laughs> nailed it on you know the final and biggest mistake is not hiring a professional ah, yes <laughs> i think the number one thing make sure you have a good tax guy because all those screw-ups that you do over the year you're going to need somebody to go through all those and, and fix everything and a, and a good tax professional is going to help you plan too so they they should be able to tell you let's say last year was a mess in 2022 you won it and you stuck it together in talking to your tax professional he should be able to give you a list of like these are the deduction categories these are um, some tools to track this stuff and some good financial planning 
right? Should you be an LLC? Should you be an S Corp? Does it matter? Um, and when does it matter to you? And every state is different. I mean, New Hampshire is super interesting because we don't have typical income tax. Right. But we do have, what is it called? Because we're not like technically one of the income tax free states. We have something, we have income tax on our investments. That's what I was going to say. So we don't have income tax on our salary or, um, but if you have an investment property right, and you then sell it, you're going to be taxed on that. If you have investments in um, a savings account or other things like that, you are taxed on the income, taxed on the taxed income, on income like for sure. So, you know, depending on what state you're in, you're really going to want to pay attention to to the rules and the only, I mean, I don't know them and everything else we have to pay attention to, I certainly don't want to learn them. So I want to have a professional that's going to protect me, right? That's right. That's right. Um, do you have someone you use locally? I don't, not actually currently looking. That's so funny. I've used the same guy for a long time, but I'm, I think I'm growing. Well, yeah. And so I, I always did TurboTax. And then, so um, over the last couple of years, I've wanted to make the shift and then it comes, it's like, I just got to get it done. Do turbo yes, tax and move totally. on. Totally. So I've I've literally I've been searching, scouring, and of course now I think taxes and when's that up soon? Yeah, April um, April fifteenth, April nineteenth. So, so yeah, so I have been on the prowl, and if you know anybody, please let me yeah, know. Yeah, let us please. know. Could love a good tax guy. So we hope you found this episode interesting. We'll have everything linked in the show notes. Please subscribe and follow us. We'll be back to you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.